Okay, so hello and welcome back to the LFS and APS uh, user conference. I really hope you enjoyed this morning session and um, the presentations, if you've been here since the beginning. Um, I now have the pleasure to introduce um, three more uh, presentations in this session. Just a reminder for all attendees, you are now in session 3A. I hope that's the one you were after. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have to join the other link for session 3B. Um, so we've got about half an hour slot for each presentation, um, including about 20 minute presentations and quite some time for questions after. I would ask attendees to put their questions in the Q&A uh, chat um, at the bottom and I can uh, read them out um, to the presenters afterwards and we can go through them one by one. Um, and if you haven't got enough time for questions, then presenters will be able to answer them directly in the chat um, afterwards. Right, first one up um, is Andrew Bryce from the University of uh, Sheffield, talking about the segregation, segmentation and disability gaps in the labour market during COVID-19. Andrew is a research associate in the Department of Economics at the University of Sheffield, and he and his co-authors were funded by the Health Foundation to investigate the labour market impacts of health in the UK. And they have currently just started a three year project unpacking the disability and employment gap in the UK, uh, funded by the Newfield Foundation. OK, Andrew, if you're ready, then uh, over to you. OK, thank you very much, Martina, for the introduction. I also want to say thank you to you and your colleagues at ONS for all the hard work you do to uh, produce this uh, really useful uh, data set. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've used a huge amount in our, our team. Uh, so this uh, work I'm going to present today is um, joint work uh, with uh, Mark Bryan, Nigel Rice, Jenny Roberts and Christina Setchell. And uh, this is um, funded by the Health Foundation. Uh, and uh, if you, hopefully you'll have a chance to ask questions, but if you want to interact with me later, you can see my Twitter address down there. So please do, uh, do um, track me down on Twitter. So uh, firstly, a summary of our research. Um, so as we all know, in uh, um, the start of uh, 2020, uh, we had this, uh, we, we had the COVID pa pandemic uh, started and it was a huge um, uh, recession, probably the biggest recession we've ever had in, uh, in living memory. Um, but um, uh, unlike um, uh, many recessions, it didn't involve a huge uh, fall in the employment rate because of the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, job retention scheme which was introduced in order to protect people's jobs. But what we did say, it, it did see is a huge number of people being temporarily away from work, for example, being on furlough. And uh, what we do find is that people with mental health or physical health disabilities have been more likely to be away from work or working reduced hours during the uh, pandemic. Um, and what we do in this paper is to decompose that into what, uh, what part of this gap can be explained by different characteristics? For example, disabled people being overrepresented in part-time work or occupations that can't be done at home. Um, but we also find that an unexplained component remains, which suggested that disabled people have either been treated or are behaving differently, even though they are in the same types of jobs. So the background to this, um, well, uh, disabled people in the UK are of working age are much, much less likely to be employed than non-disabled people. The, the gap is particularly big for uh, people with a mental health disability or 52 percentage points, uh, but it's also very big for people with a uh, physical health disability. And reducing this gap is a major government policy. Um, the uh, aim is to increase disabled employment by one million between 2017 and 2027. And this was the subject of a Work and Pensions Committee inquiry uh, about a year ago, which our team um, contributed to. Now this uh, uh, employment gap has been narrowing uh, since 2013, but uh, how will this trend be affected by, by COVID? Now, uh, clearly there's been a lot of uh, research on the labor market effects of, uh, of the pandemic uh, and the fact that it has affected uh, different groups uh, um, 
unequally, uh, and much of the evidence has been based on things like ethnicity, age, and gender. Uh, there's significantly less been written about how disabled people have been affected, although Emerson et al. 2021 and Jones 2022 are exceptions. And as I said before, the job retention scheme has cushioned the blow of the pandemic, but the fact that some people have been more affected, have, ha have had their jobs um, uh, restricted, uh, may have possible long-term uh, effects. So let's just look briefly at the theory. Why is it that disabled people might have um, worse uh, labor market outcomes than non-disabled people? Well, uh, part of this might be to do with discrimination. So employers may discriminate against disabled people either directly, simply due to prejudice, or discrimination can also um, happen indirectly. For example, employers may incorrectly assume that disabled people have lower productivity uh, or are more likely to, to leave the job. Um, and uh, this can lead to um, uh, unequal uh, outcomes. Um, however, uh, part of the story may not be about uh, discrimination within jobs, but just the fact that disabled people are concentrated in particular um, sectors or particular types of job. And so we've uh, um, classified this as segregation and segmentation. So segregation means that there's an unequal distribution of disabled workers across occupations uh, and or industries. Now, this is a very common explanation for um, uh, explaining something like the, the gender uh, pay gap, whereby within a particular job, maybe men and women are being paid the same, but because uh, women tend to be more concentrated in particular types of occupation or particular types of industries where pay might be lower, this is what explains the gender pay gap rather than directly discrimination in many cases. Um, and we propose that, and we find in this paper, the same thing happens uh, for disabled workers compared to non-disabled workers. And uh, we also uh, look at segmentation, which is very similar to segregation, but this is about on the unequal distribution of disabled workers across different contractual arrangements. Again, when we look at gender, we know that uh, women are much, much more likely than men to work part-time, and part-time workers uh, tend to be more vulnerable. For example, when there's a recession, they're often the, the, the workers that get laid off uh, um, at first, uh, and therefore this can uh, explain why uh, women might be more vulnerable in the labor market than men. And again, we, we use this same uh, theory and the same ideas to explain the uh, uh, difference in outcomes um, between disabled and non-disabled people. So our hyp hypothesis that we're testing in this paper uh, is that we um, suggest that COVID-19 has widened the disability gap, not in employment as such, but in these variables away from work and reduced hours, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And these gaps should be partly explained by measurable factors relating to segmentation and segregation. Uh, that includes industry occupation, workplace size, public sector affiliation, and part-time status. But part of the gap will remain unexplained. And this could be caused by uh, discrimination, which I, which I talked about before, but but it might not be that. Um, it could be that it actually reflects worker preferences. So if uh, disabled people are more likely to be going on furlough than non-disabled people, this could be to do with their preferences. Maybe they're uh, clinically vulnerable or more likely to be clinically vulnerable and actually are wanting to um, uh, stay at home or, or, or go on furlough or reduce their hours. Or it might be that their employer is pushing them towards that and maybe are pushing disabled uh, employees into furlough more than non-disabled. So let's let, now look at the data. So we use the quarterly LFS and um, in this uh, decomposition analysis, which I'm going to present, we focus on uh, quarter two of 2020 and compare that with quarter two of 2019. And we focus on three labour market outcomes, whether in employment and whether temporarily away from work and also whether working reduced hours due to being laid off 
uh, short time or work interrupted by economic and other causes. Um, this, uh, this question um, focuses on people who say that they've, they've done uh, uh, that the actual hours they did in the reference week was lower than their uh, usual hours. And this was the reason that they, they give. And we find that this, uh, th this response has been used quite a lot since the pandemic began. Um, uh, and we also um, exploit the fact that the LFS has a really nice definition of disability uh, based on the Equality Act 2010, which is whether, the, whether they had a health, any health condition or illness lasting 12 months or more, which reduces ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities. So um, disability status is a derived variable in LFS, and that is our, the primary um, uh, variable that we use, uh, our explanatory variable that we use. Um, but we also um, uh, look at the particular condition that they report, and we use that to split this into mental health and physical health. Um, uh, our method is the uh, Waxica blinder decomposition method. I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail, but just to give you the intuition. So if we're interested in finding out the difference between um, the labor market outcome, why? Um, of disabled people versus non-disabled people, um, we find that this can be broken down into what we call characteristics. So these X's are the particular observable characteristics of the individual. And let's say that X stands for education. We know that uh, the more education you get, the higher returns, the better labor market outcomes you have. So if, for example, uh, disabled people are less likely to have a degree, that means that because, the, because uh, the returns to a degree are higher than the returns to lower level qualifications, this would explain why there might be a gap in these uh, outcomes for disabled people because they're less likely to have the kind of characteristics which um, predict uh, good, uh, good outcomes. Uh, and then we have this other component, which is coefficients. So again, thinking about education, we might see that on average, disabled people with a degree actually have worse outcomes than non-disabled people with a degree. So the returns to education are lower for disabled people, which this could uh, um, be evidence of discrimination. So what we do is we break it down to the characteristics, sort of the explained part and the coefficients, which is the unexplained part. Um, and these are the different variables we use. So um, the, uh, the X variables, um, we have education and experience. We have 19 categories of industry, nine categories of occupation. Uh, that's your uh, segregation, industry and occupation. And the segmentation side is uh, size of workplace, self-employed status, whether public or private sector, and whether part-time or full-time work. And we also look at region and demographic controls. So now let's have a look at the results. First of all, some um, uh, descriptive results. So here we see that the disability gap um, in employment uh, is, is very big, as I saw before, uh, particularly with regards to mental health, which is this uh, pink line at the bottom. But we see that uh, after the pandemic, which is shown by this vertical dotted line, there was actually very little change in the employment rates uh, of men and women and also in the gap. That's because the job retention scheme protected people's employment, and so very few people were actually laid off. But when we look at these other outcomes away from work, we see this massive spike in 2020 quarter two in people who were temporarily away from work. And we see that the gap actually increased between disabled people, uh, which is the top uh, lines here, and the black line, which is, which is our comparison group, non-disabled people. And that was the same for men and women. And similarly, with uh, reduced hours, we see that uh, from almost a baseline of almost zero before the pandemic, the number of people on reduced hours increased more for disabled people than black line, which is non-disabled people. And uh, we can also look at uh, how people are concentrated in different occupations and industries. And we see that uh, non-disabled people tend to be um, more heavily concentrated in professional occupations. And um, 
disabled people, particularly those with mental health uh, dis disabilities, um, are, are more concentrated in elementary occupations um, and uh, for women, particularly in caring, leisure and other service occupations. And we see a similar uh, picture by industry. So, um, and then again, it's particularly mental health disabled people who are affected. Um, they are more likely to be um, employed in wholesale and retail uh, and more likely to be employed in um, accommodation and food services. So already we can see this um, kind of segregation going on. These kind of jobs, which people couldn't do at home, which uh, resulted in people being put on furlough, um, disabled people were, were already more concentrated in these jobs and so they were going to be more vulnerable to lockdown. And uh, we can also then have a look at the uh, particular uh, gaps um, between disabled and non-disabled people. So the um, um, while, while, while in the top graph here, we see the gap in employment. And while that is uh, particularly big for those with uh, uh, who are disabled, with mentally he mental health disabled, um, there's not really any change between 2019 and 2020. Where we do see the change is in away from work, where the gap uh, actually increases both for mental health and for physical health. And we also see a, a gap of about five percentage points in the um, number of people, the number of employed people who are working reduced hours in, uh, this is in quarter two of 2020. So what we do then is, um, uh, sorry, this, this is now the female um, gaps and this is similar, so it's a similar picture, uh, except that we see the, the gap is, uh, the gap in reduced hours is a little bit lower for women than it is for, for men. But in general terms, the picture is the, the same. The gaps have increased as a result of the pandemic. So what we then do is decompose this into characteristics and coefficients. And uh, the highlight of this graph is that this, this orange bar, which is the coefficients, is the main part. So this is the, the unexplained part, the part which might be to do with um, um, being treated or behaving differently because you're disabled. But what we do see is that the blue part, um, particularly on the mental health side, which is the characteristics, actually becomes more important after the pandemic. It becomes more important in 2020 than 2019, which does show that segregation and segmentation have been playing a role um, uh, more so um, because of the pandemic and because that has um, uh, affected different types of jobs in different ways. Um, uh, what we uh, also do, as well as just looking at this, uh, this overall decomposition, we, we, we drill down and look at the particular uh, observable characteristics which uh, explain um, these gaps. Um, so um, there wasn't that much um, so, the, so what we show here are just the significant, uh, the statistically significant gaps, um, uh, of the, the, the the characteristics which ex, uh, which are statistically significant in terms of explaining the gaps, and we see that there's much more here in the away from work gap. Um, there's uh, th there are many more explanations here. So we we see that uh, segmentation is very important, and this is particularly related to part-time work. So for example, uh, about 8% of non-disabled men uh, who are employed work part-time, whereas 22% of uh, men with a mental health disability uh, work part-time. And so because part-time workers were much more likely to be away from work uh, during, the, uh, during the first lockdown, this explains a lot of the gap. Um, in fact, for all of the uh, the gaps, men and women, and both mental health and physical health. Occupation is also very important. Uh, and here we find that disabled people are more um, concentrated in elementary occupations or caring uh, and leisure and other service occupations, uh, particularly uh, females, um, and are less um, concentrated in managerial and professional occupations. So the kind of occupations which
uh, people had to go on furlough because they couldn't work from home because their workplace had been shut down. This is where disabled people were concentrated. And, uh, and this is explaining significantly this away from work gap. And we also see the same with education and experience. Again, this is about having a, a degree, uh, people with degrees uh, or higher qualifications tend to be able to work from home and were less affected by the pandemic. Uh, and um, disabled, disabled people were less concentrated in those areas. Uh, and we do see some similar effects explaining the reduced hours gap as well in 2020. <clears throat> but still, I would emphasize that coefficients, i.e. the unexplained component, still explains most of the gap, which does show that uh, even within jobs, within sectors, um, disabled people were being treated differently and did have different outcomes. So I'll finally move on to my conclusions and then we can move on to questions. So while employment has generally been protected, we see that the pandemic has exposed new inequalities in the outcomes of disabled workers, namely propensity to be away from work or on reduced hours. So a relatively small proportion of this is due to characteristics that can be observed, but this component did increase in 2020. So the pandemic has exacerbated the segmentation and segregation of disabled workers. Um, and um, this is particularly due to uh, disabled people being more likely to be in part-time jobs um, and having uneven uh, distribution across occupations. There's less of a evidence of a segregation effect, uh, although uh, men um, with mental health disabilities were more likely to work in accommodation and food services, uh, and this did um, affect their likelihood of uh, being away from work. So most of the gap remains to do with coefficients, which means that this could be due to employer attitudes. Uh, so for example, risk averse employers may have been more likely to want to uh, temporary lay off or furlough disabled people, or it could be to do with worker preferences, disabled people wanted to go on furlough to protect their health. So what does this mean long-term? Well, we're not quite sure yet, but in, this, in the post um, JRS world, uh, this could involve structural unemployment um, as redundant jobs will, uh, are no longer supported. And this may disproportion disproportionately affect the employment prospects of disabled people. So the focus should be on ensuring disabled people have the training and skills needed in the restructured post-COVID, post-Brexit economy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Really in interesting piece of work. We'll move on to our next presenter, Magdalene. Uh, Magdalene Oklu from the University of Bath. She'll be speaking about modelling um, the differences, a uh, different impact of COVID-19 in the UK labour market. Magdalene is a lecturer and researcher in macroeconomics, and she completed her PhD and began lecturing in, in the University of Bath in 2021. Her research interests include DC, uh, DSGE and labour market search modules and the UK gig economy. Um, right, Magdalene, if you're ready, then I'll hand over to you. Yes, thank you. Can I just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Lovely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me and um, thank you to... Um, to um, the organizers for the opportunity to present my research. I will be discussing today a, um, the, a paper on the different impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the UK labor market. It's a paper I have co-authored with Chris Martin and we have recently revised and resubmitted it to the Oxford Bulletin for Economics and Statistics. So in the next 20 minutes, I will talk you through our research motivation. I will spend most of the time on discussing uh, how we analyze the data. I will run through the model and conclude with our um, baseline results and some scenarios. So why did we um, choose to write this paper? The COVID-19 pandemic had a massive impact on the UK labor market. But in particular, before the pandemic even, there, ha there has been evidence in the data that graduates were more likely to earn higher wages and be in more stable jobs than non-graduates. And there's, we, um, the data shows a lot of job-to-job -job movement. Workers are more likely to move from job to job than from unemployment into employment. So putting all these points together, we try to see if 
we could use a relatively simple model, macroeconomic model, to describe the, the extreme turbulence induced by the um, pandemic. We also try to see if we could analyze the differing impacts of the pandemic on different types of workers in the UK. And also we try to measure the impact of the job retention scheme. So our results closely match the um, results for output and employment throughout the pandemic. Our analysis also shows that non-graduates were worse off during the pandemic than graduates. And our results suggest that the GRS, the job retention scheme, saved or prevented the loss of um, between four to five million of the furloughed jobs from being lost. And most of the saved jobs were the were low-wage jobs, mostly held by non-graduates. So um, how does our paper differ from the rest in the literature? What we did was to construct a DSG model with labor market search frictions. Our model has four distinct labor markets for graduates, non-graduates in high and low SOC occupations. I'll talk more about high and low SOC um, occupations in the coming slides. We also model job to job movements and our model um, tracks about 12 distinct worker transitions. Most importantly, we have a richer combination of shocks to describe the pandemic. We've got, we model aggregate demand and supply shocks, but we also have um, job specific shocks to um, capture the evidence that workers in low SSC employment were more likely to be furloughed and furloughed for a longer period than those in high SSC employment. And we also model shocks to job destruction induced by the pandemic. Now, moving on to the data, we use the five quarter um, longitudinal LFS data. For before the pandemic, we used data from the end of 2018 to the end of 2019. And for the pandemic period, we used the end of 2019 to the end of 2020. Um, for graduates, we, um, we split workers into graduates and non-graduates. Graduates are those who have at least the first degree and non-graduates are all the others without, with, a, with less than a first degree. For high productivity jobs, we classify those as those in SOC groups one to three. And low productivity jobs, we classify those as the rest, that's groups four to nine. Now, for the period before the pandemic, we did a small analysis on the data set. And this pie chart here shows us that non-graduates are highly likely to be out of work than non-graduates. And um, the pie chart also shows that there's a substantial number of non-graduates who have um, high SOC jobs, but there is an even greater proportion of graduates who have high SOC jobs. And in particular, we observe that there's, um, there's, there's a greater proportion of non-graduates in low SOC jobs than, um, than the number of graduates in low SOC um, jobs. Moving on to transitions before the pandemic, our table here, um, we, um, we tracked movement, the movement of workers from employment into non-employment and the reverse. What we noticed in the data is that there, there was a lot of movement between unemployment and inactivity and the reverse, and a lot of movement, movement from inactivity and unemployment into employment and the reverse. So what we did was to bunch the inactive and the unemployed into one group, which we call the non-employed. So we track movements of workers from different states of employment through the five quarters of um, the pre-pandemic period and took an average, which is what we display in this table. From the table, we see that um, low SOC jobs are more likely to break down for both graduates and non-graduates. We also can see from the table that non-graduates are more likely to remain in low SOC jobs than graduates. Also, we see that graduates are more likely to remain in high SOC employment than non-graduates. 
and graduates and non-graduates are more likely to move from job to job than they are to move from non-employment into employment. And finally, we find that non-graduates are more likely to remain out of work than graduates. Now to the pandemic period, we see from our table that employment seems fairly stable across all four quarters of the pandemic. But I think we can see a clear picture of what happened during the pandemic in this next chart here, where we track the changes in the levels of employment of different categories from quarter to quarter in millions. And here we see that the non-graduates in low SOC employment were the first and hardest hit by the pandemic. And the impact of the pandemic comes on for other types of workers later on in the year. Now, um, a few caveats about the um, LFS data um, we used. There are suggestions that the, um, the LFS may have understated the extent of job loss during the pandemic for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which is that some workers may have um, changed their, their employment status say from self-employed to employee in order to access um, support under the government scheme. That factor does not affect our analysis because we analyze both the self-employed and the employees. Also, there were workers who were doing no hours, earning no wage, and were not furloughed, but still reported themselves as employed. For example, um, business owners who could not access um, um, support under, the job, um, under a government scheme, or zero-hour contract workers, for example, such workers would, would um, th there was a bit of a gray area between what was called being employed and being unemployed or non-employed during the pandemic. And still on furloughing, um, the LFS data we used did not collect information on the workers that were furloughed. There was the Understanding Society survey um, data, which collected furlough data, but that data set was, um, we couldn't get all the ca um, categories or the characteristics of workers that we wanted for the paper with that data set. So we stuck with the 5Q longitudinal LFS data. However, in this data set we used, um, we here in this chart, we see that from measuring the proportional percentage of workers who reported themselves as employed, but were doing no hours, we see a spike from the beginning of 2020, um, indicating the, some workers being furloughed or, um, and the highest spike we see is of non-graduates in low SOC um, employment. It gives us a feel of the extent of furloughing and the extent of workers who were just reporting um, zero hours while reporting being employed. Now, moving on to the model, we, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we workers can be either employed or non-employed, and the non-employed are the sum of the unemployed and the inactive. We assume that all workers search, and um, all the, the categories of workers non-employed, either being non-employed in high productivity employment or low productivity employment, these categories are, we ad adopted the numbers from all the ones we have seen in the table earlier. Also, the red arrows indicate the transition of workers from one state into the other and highlight the transitions of workers we just saw in the table earlier. We also assume that there's one type of firm that offers four types of jobs, um, graduates and non-graduates in high and low productivity types of um, employment. We assume that productivity varies from job position to job position and that the firm bargains with each type of worker, which gives us four distinct um, wage equations. We also assume that job destruction is exogenous. I will speak about that at the end of the presentation. So how we calibrated the pandemic shocks. We assume that the pandemic would have induced a 
the pandemic did induce a fall in aggregate demand, but we assume that the job retention scheme reduced that fall in aggregate demand. We assume that the pandemic would have brought on a fall in aggregate supply from social distancing, from working from home and so forth. But we assume that the job retention scheme would have worsened that negative impact because of furloughing. We also assume that um, because of furloughing and the fact that some workers, especially those in low productivity employment, were more likely to be furloughed and furloughed for a longer period, we reflect that by an additional fall in um, productivity for the low SOC um, um, jobs. We also assume that the pandemic would have induced job destruction or increased job destruction, but the job retention scheme would have reduced that negative or that impact on job, um, on job destruction. And finally, we assume that the pandemic would have induced a fall in wages, but the wage subsidy under the job retention scheme would have mitigated that fall in wages. So all of this we have just discussed are what we have outlined in the baseline column here. Now, how to measure the impact of the job retention scheme. What we did was to, um, in order to measure the impact of the job retention scheme, we tried to imagine a scenario where the job retention scheme did not exist and compare that to the baseline. So we, we actually tried four different scenarios, but I'm, for the sake of time, just going to present two scenarios. In scenario one, we assume that in the absence of the job retention scheme, Productivity would have fallen, but just by a very small amount compared to the baseline. There would be no wage subsidy. And we assume that the fall in aggregate demand would have been similar to the baseline. And job destruction, of course, would have been higher. In the second scenario, we try to imagine the reverse now. We imagine that in the absence of the job retention scheme, productivity would have fallen by a lot, but by an amount similar to the baseline. As before, there will be no wage subsidy. And then we assume that in the absence of the job retention scheme, the impact on aggregate demand would have been a lot, double the, the impact in the baseline. And we also assume that um, job destruction is higher. Now, quickly moving on to the results. The results, the um, graphs in the straight line show the results of our um, simulation, whereas the, um, the graphs in the dotted, the dotted lines indicate the actual. So um, our, our results closely match the um, results for outputs during the pandemic and the recovery. For employment, our results fairly match the, the actual but our results also show the relatively small fall in employment for both graduates and non-graduates throughout the um, pandemic. And um, the results for wages as well shows the fall in real wages at the peak of the pandemic and the spike in wages during the recovery period due to um, composition effects. Now to analyzing the impact of the job retention scheme, in the graphs shown here, the straight lines are the results of our simulation. The dashed lines are the results of scenario one, and the dashed and crossed lines are the results of scenario two. So um, what we see here is that the, the results for um, scenarios one and two are quite different from each other. Although the scenarios are a bit a reverse of themselves, but the results for graduate and non-graduate employment are a bit more similar, more consistent, which gives us a bit more um, confidence about the, the, out, the outcome for employment than for um, output. And um, what we see here is that the, or how, how we calculated things is the difference between the, the, the scenario results and the baseline results gives us the number of jobs that might have been saved in, um, by the um, job retention scheme. And this translates to between four and five million um, jobs, most of which would have been the, those held by non-graduates. So um, finally, our results, our results show that 
a simple, a relatively simple DSG model with labor market search can give some insight into what happened during the pandemic and can be useful for policy analysis. However, um, we made a series of strong assumptions. For example, we assumed that the, the economy was in steady state before the pandemic. This assumption was convenient for us to make because what we were looking or what we are looking at is the impact of the pandemic on the labor market. But what we could do better in future research might be to analyze the, um, the labor market for a longer period before the pandemic, say the decade before the pandemic, um, and compare that to um, the data during the pandemic. Also, we assume that the economy goes back to, or the economy will go back to steady state, and there's no permanent impact of the pandemic on the labor market, which at the moment we still do not, um, cannot be sure of. Also, our results for inflation don't match the actual for inflation. This is because we assumed that um, inflation is a fixed markup on the marginal cost. And because we modeled the wage subsidy due to the job retention scheme, the wage was, um, the marginal cost was relatively flat. And so inflation was relatively flat as well. So, um, Going forward, it would be interesting to analyze the impact of the pandemic on other types of workers, for example, um, the gig economy, gig workers, zero hour contract workers, and so forth. And um, it will also be interesting to analyze the impact of the pand pandemic from the, from the aspect of the firms and, and how firms um, were ad ad adapted through the pandemic. In particular, we assumed that job destruction was exogenous and then modeled a shock representing the impact of the, um, of the pandemic. We could model the decision of the firms to say, destroy a job, um, furlough a worker or, or not furlough a worker, for example. So those are things that we can consider in, um, in future work. So I will leave it here for now and take your questions. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to our third presenter in this session, Francesca Fuliano. Um, she, she works at the uh, UCL Social Research Institute and she is a research fellow. Uh, her main research interests are in economics of education, labor economics, family economics and international trade. So Francesca, if you're ready. I can hand over to you. Uh, I think you're still muted. Oops. Yes, yeah, thank now you. Now I can hear you. <laughs> so I, okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for staying for this presentation and thank you very much to the organizers for uh, allowing me to present uh, this uh, work. This is a project uh, that has been going on for a few years now um, and uh, um, is joined with my uh, colleague Rebecca Riley from King's uh, College. Uh, this paper is titled uh, Global Competition UK Labour Market Adjustment at the Brexit Vote and this part of a bigger project funded by the Nuffield Foundation. So in this uh, research, our aim was trying to understand how the UK labor market uh, adjusted to the sharp rise in uh, um, imports from low wage countries. In particular, we focused on uh, imports from China and uh, um, the Eastern European countries that joined the EU in 2004. And uh, what we look at is uh, how uh, these imports affected mainly the manufacturing sector, but then more widely uh, other local labor, uh, other um, labor outcomes in uh, local labor markets uh, and also uh, workers mobility across areas and voting patterns. Uh, we focus on the uh, populist vote, in particular vote for UKIP and uh, the Brexit uh, vote in 2016. So before going on, I just wanted to present the usual disclaimer about the data. And uh, I take advantage of this to say thanks to uh, all of the ONS uh, for the amazing work they do. Uh, I must say, I mean, these data are great. Uh, I use the Labor for Survey and ASH data for this um, work and uh, they're great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> 
Okay, so motivations. Uh, why, uh, why do we care about these? There are lots of papers already in the economics literature that look at the effect of uh, uh, trade exposure, uh, increase in import competition from China in particular on local labor markets. There are some papers uh, that look at different outcomes in the US, uh, papers that look at uh, different countries in the EU. So why do we care about another paper? Um, well, what is interesting is that the way labor markets in different countries have adjusted to change in international trade differed according to institutional settings and uh, the uh, economic structure um, of, uh, uh, of the country. And, uh, um, understanding the mechanisms through which uh, um, in the UK local labor markets adjust to structural changes is important, in particular because Brexit has already started to bring such uh, some of these uh, structural changes already, uh, but also because the green transition is likely to bring more and, uh, and now after two years of pandemic we might face uh, other challenges. So understanding how um, the local labor markets are adjust to uh, employment shocks is important because it can help uh, designing more targeted policies that can contrast the inevitable inequalities that comes uh, with the structural changes uh, in the economy. Um, okay. So uh, wh why, uh, why we care about China? Why, why do, we, do we focus on China and the eight countries, that is the Eastern European countries that joined the EU in 2004? So what, what happened was that uh, China, both China and the Eastern European countries, China from the 80s, Eastern European countries from the, from the 90s, um, experienced an incredible increase in um, uh, labor productivity. And this made them uh, ready to uh, respond to international uh, trade, international demand for goods uh, in a very fast way. Um, here I present uh, just a descriptive uh, trend in trade uh, that the UK had with, uh, as had with China and uh, um, the eight countries. And here you can see that the import share from China increased from 95 to 2015 by a factor of five. And and uh, the imports share uh, from uh, um, eight country increased by a factor of four. Uh, at the same time, um, the exports uh, from the UK to China um, increased as well by a factor of four, whereas the exports from uh, the UK to um, eight countries didn't uh, experience a particular change. Um, but um, clearly, uh, this uh, these, uh, these increase in... Uh, in uh, um, uh, imports from uh, these countries, these low-wage countries, happened in a particular moment from the, for the UK, in a moment in which the manufacturing sector um, uh, experienced uh, a uh, shrunk. Uh, in particular, uh, if we look at the same period, the 95 to 2015, we see that the share of jobs by industry decreased by uh, from 16% to uh, 7%, an increase in, in, in uh, like a great uh, decrease that was not experienced by other uh, industries in the UK over the same period. It is also important to realize that uh, this uh, um, shrinking, shrinking of the manufacturing sector happened in a it was part of a long-term decrease uh, in manufacturing jobs, um, partly driven uh, by technological changes, um, changing tastes, uh, and uh, also the um, explosion of the service sector that was happening at the same time, uh, together with, of course, import competition um, uh, from uh, um, other countries. And so the aim of our paper is mostly to disentangle how much of the um, change in manufacturing jobs uh, is uh, driven by uh, import competition from China and A8. And then look at the mechanism uh, through which local labor markets uh, adjusted to this uh, shock. Okay, so these are the research questions in our paper. Did China and uh, plus A8 trade shock affect the UK manufacturing sector in the long term? How did the local labor markets adjust over time? And did the increase in trade exposure of local labor market effects uh, affect the rise in the populist vote and the vote to leave the EU?
So these are the main uh, results that we'll present, the questions and the res relative results that we'll present today. So what we do in this paper, as I said, we, we focus on the period 2000-2015. Uh, during this period, we know that China uh, joins the WTO and uh, um, the A8 uh, joined the EU. But as I said, their uh, productivity growth had started uh, way before then. The um, uh, local labor markets, we, we uh, our unit of analysis uh, are travel to work areas. Uh, this is how we define our local labor markets. We define a measure of change in local import penetration that follows uh, Otor, uh, Dorn and Hanson, which uh, uh, who have a seminal paper on uh, the effect of import exposure on US manufacturing uh, sector. And we estimate the effect of import exposure on local labor market outcomes for the long run by accounting for possible endogeneity uh, of these uh, trade shock. Um, that is, we use an instrumental variable um, uh, estimator. And we investigate the influence of trade shocks on the populist vote. Very quickly, a preview of the results. Uh, what we find is that uh, an increase in import competition uh, between 2000 and 2015 uh, from country with relatively low pay resulted in a decline in total manufacturing jobs. Uh, workers moved out of manufacturing into low skill, low paid non-manufacturing job. And this change was associated with a decrease in mean, well, uh, today I will present median actually, but uh, we have the same uh, result for mean as well. Mean and median weekly earnings in non-manufacturing sectors, particularly in low-skilled occupations. Uh, we also find an increased skill polarization across, across different areas of the UK. That is basically, we observe that uh, skilled workers move away from areas more affected by import competition to um, other areas less affected. In addition, we observe um, that uh, actually import competition has very little effect uh, on uh, um, the populist vote. Uh, uh, if not, if any. And uh, uh, actually, this is more driven by long-standing um, economic characteristics of the areas that the more voted for uh, UKIP and uh, um, leave during the Brexit uh, referendum. And uh, uh, possibly also driven by uh, the move of more skilled, uh, the movement of more skilled workers uh, away from these areas. Okay, how do we contribute? We, we contribute uh, to the literature by uh, presenting a, a comprehensive study of the effect of the increased trade exposure on local labor market outcomes in the UK. And we explore in particular the effect of import penetration on internal migration, which hasn't been done uh, before. And we link these changes to uh, recent election results. Um, I'll skip this, but there is a wide literature that looks at uh, trade competition on uh, uh, local labor markets, uh, firms, and uh, election results. And uh, we, we, we contribute to these, uh, presenting some results for the UK. So um, methodology, we use, as I said, the methodology pioneered by uh, author Dorn and Hanson. And basically this methodology is based on uh, two questions. They asked where in the country did the UK produce before the trade shocks, the goods that now are imported from China and the A8? And what has happened in those parts of the country relative to other parts of the country since the steep increase in trade exposure? So it is interesting to focus on China and the A8 as I said before, because um, uh, they, the, the increase in imports from these uh, countries was mostly driven by a supply shock. The fact that these countries were having uh, political changes uh, that made them more productive. Uh, definitely, there was also a domestic component that we try to, um, uh, let's say, address with uh, an instrumental variable estimation. So how do we define for each uh, local labor market a measure of import exposure per worker? So um, basically, in order to create this measure, the, the, the idea behind this measure, uh, the idea that Otto and Dorn and Hanson had, was that the exposure of local labor markets to trade penetration differs according to their um, initial industry employment specialization. So in this case, um, the, the change in import 
super competition for uh, the labor, local labor market I is given by the sum over all industries J uh, of the uh, total change in imports from change uh, from China and A8 countries between 2000 and 2015, uh, weighted by um, the local share of employment by industry J. And then this measure is then divided by the, num the number uh, of uh, total jobs in the local labor market. So this gives a monetary measure per worker of how much uh, the area is exposed to import competition from these uh, low wage countries. We consider also uh, alternative measures, in particular measures that take into account um, competition in uh, international markets as well, because of course the UK not only competes uh, with China and A8 countries uh, in the domestic market, but also international markets, and also a net measure that takes into account exports from the UK to these countries. But the results are broadly similar, so I will focus on uh, the results for import competition only. Um, then once we have this measure, uh, we estimate the following equations. So on the left hand side, we have a change in local labor market outcomes and uh, in case of votes, a change in UKIP votes in, UKIP votes in uh, uh, for the European uh, elections. And uh, on the right hand side, we have the measure of import exposure uh, plus a comprehensive set of controls at local labor market level and the list of controls are here. And mostly uh, we include everything that can describe the, um, uh, the, the initial conditions and the changes uh, in uh, uh, the local labor uh, markets during this period, 2000, 2015. So as I said, uh, our beta, the, 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 the parameter of interest, which is the impact of import uh, competition, the change in import competition on local labor market outcomes, uh, relies on the fact that uh, this change is uh, um, exogenous. So it's only due to a supply shock. However, we know that this might not be the case and there might be reasons, uh, internal reasons for which also the demand for imported and domestic goods changes. So we take into account this, we have an instrumental variable uh, estimation where um, in the, we, we instrument the uh, measure I presented before with uh, a similar measure where the total change in imports is now given by the change in imports from uh, other European countries. In particular, we focus on the EU15 minus the UK. And uh, the share uh, for uh, the share of employment by, um, by industry for each local uh, labor market is instead measured, uh, instead of the in 2000, is measured for 1995. We use um, uh, several uh, data sets for this analysis, but mostly uh, we use the labor force survey and ASH data. And the labor force survey was uh, uh, used to create all of the local labor market outcomes um, and uh, the measures, uh, uh, so all of the shares the, uh, that are part of this uh, measure of um, import exposure uh, that I discussed uh, so far. Okay, so the final data set, basically we have a final data set that has 232 observation, um, by, uh, one for each travel to work area and measure changes in trade exposure and labor market uh, variables between 2000 and 2015. Okay, so just to give a, an idea of this measure of uh, uh, import competition. Um, so uh, basically uh, the mean of this measure across the UK is 1,433 pounds. So this is the uh, import exposure per worker, the mean import exposure per worker in the UK between the periods 2000, 2000 and 2015. Um, here we can see that uh, considering also international imports increases, uh, in, sorry, uh, competition in international markets increases this measure. At the same time, when, it, when we take into account the exports, this measure is decreased, but is broadly uh, similar. Um, and this gives uh, a, um, an idea of how this measure differs across uh, the country, the, the UK.
Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna go. On, I'm gonna present now the main results of this analysis. So a change in import competition um, uh, determines, as we can expect, a change in manufacturing jobs per head and manufacturing jobs. So um, a an increase in import competition means that the manufacturing jobs per head and manufacturing jobs decrease in the areas mo more exposed to uh, import competition. We don't see any effect on non-manufacturing jobs per head, uh, and uh, we see a, a total effect uh, driven by the manufacturing jobs. So areas that are um, affected by uh, more trade competition compared to others see a decrease in the total number of jobs driven by a decrease in jobs in manufacturing. Um, for what it concerns um, the um, median weekly earnings, we observe that um, uh, these are quite interesting. So we observed that in the manufacturing sector, the um, earnings actually go up. So areas that are more exposed to trade competition, to import competition, um, see an increase in, uh, uh, in the median weekly earnings. And this is a compositional effect due to the fact that uh, um, the workers that were laid off over time uh, were mostly, lo were mostly low-skilled workers. Um, but then when we focus on other sectors, in particular low skill non-manufacturing, we see that there is a decrease in uh, uh, median weekly earnings in these sectors too. And uh, uh, this is clearly driven by the fact that uh, low skilled workers who were laid off by uh, the manufacturing sector were then absorbed by low skill non-manufacturing sectors, determining um, a lowering uh, of the weekly earnings. And uh, we see uh, this effect more general for all uh, median weekly earnings in areas more affected by import competition. So there is um, a general depression of wages in these areas compared to others. Then um, we see that actually in the long term, there's no effect on an unemployment rate. Uh, and uh, um, in our analysis, we look also at the medium term. In the medium term, there is an effect on unemployment rate. Unemployment rate goes up. But then uh, when we look at the long term, that is 15 years, the unemployment rate uh, is not affected. And this is, again, a result of the fact that the low-skilled workers were, um, uh, they were uh, ab absorbed by a low-skilled non-manufacturing sector. Then we look at the population changes. So we are interested in seeing whether uh, these uh, uh, trade shocks uh, had an effect on the population uh, in areas more affected uh, by them. So we see that uh, the total population seemed to decrease. However, this result is not statistically significant. Uh, but what we observe is that there is a clear decrease in the population with degree level. So it looks like um, that uh, people, uh, the skilled workers, um, uh, some uh, skilled workers, uh, once these areas are affected by uh, trade competition, uh, leave the areas. Um, and uh, um, uh, we observe this in these results. Uh, and also we see that the share of working age population with, degree, with degrees um, decreases uh, over time. That is, areas more affected by import competition see a decrease in the share of working age population with degrees uh, relative to other areas. We perform also uh, an analysis using ASH data at individual level. Uh, basically, I'm not going to go into the details, but, but what we look at, we use longitudinal ASH data to see how, uh, um, whether uh, individuals who we can observe both in 2000 and 2015 are more likely to move away from areas that were more affected by uh, trade competition. And we see that actually this is the case, that um, uh, individuals who are in areas uh, more affected by trade competition were more likely to move away. And this uh, is particularly true for uh, high skilled workers and workers with high ability uh, to earn. I'm going to skip this, otherwise I won't have time. But very quickly, I want to talk about the UKIP votes, uh, the, the results for the UKIP votes. So when we look at the changes in UKIP votes in European parliamentary elections between 2004 and 2014 on the uh, import competition, uh, the change in import competition measure, we observe um, that uh, there is an association, uh, but uh, this associ association disappears once we control for a comprehensive set of 
of, uh, uh, of characteristics of the local labor market. And this seems to suggest that actually um, was not a trade competition, but rather long-standing economic issues that, see, that uh, uh, have driven uh, the populist vote in, uh, in, in areas more affected by import competition. And um, very similar results, uh, we obtained very similar results for the um, EU referendum in 2016. Once we control for a comprehensive set of results, there's no uh, association. Uh, and uh, um, given uh, the, uh, the, the relationship between the share of population with degree and uh, the, the share of leave votes, it is likely that uh, what we can say possibly is that the um, trade competition uh, affected uh, the populist vote more uh, by uh, moving skilled workers away from certain areas, um, workers that were probably more likely uh, not to vote for you keep or leave in the Brexit referendum. And uh, so, just uh, uh, I'll go very quickly through the conclusion. So um, in this paper, we study the effect of trade shocks on the UK labor market. We observe um, the longer trend consequence for unemployment that were mitigated as lower skilled workers moved to non-manufacturing sectors and took lower pay. Higher skilled workers moved away from more exposed areas. And this last result partly might explain the correlation between import exposure and the leave vote and the vote, the, the increase in the vote for UKIP. Thank you very much.